All right, so as you see here, I've got all my pieces of foam cut. Uh, I've got them glued in place. I'd like to glue the foam in place with either hot glue, which is probably my preferred method, is just a hot glue gun on the foam. Just watch your fingers. If there's a lot of uh, pieces that need some long time to set, like larger slabs like you see here, uh, the hot glue will dry before you can actually get it together and then it'll also melt into the foam. So that's kind of a problem. <laughs> so what I do there is I use something like liquid nails. You can get this in small tubes like this. I happen to have it handy uh, like this. You can also get, if you're doing a large area or a lot of foam, you can get the, uh, the caulking gun. You notice a couple of things here. I have the pink foam where I know that I'm going to have land masses just open, open areas of, of grass and fields, maybe towns, in this case it's gonna be a field. And then I use this florist foam, open cell foam, uh, for the areas where I know there's going to be some dense trees. So what we have here is the, the mill building in the background. That's the other thing I've gotten done. I don't think I've showed you that yet, but the, the mill, I built a, a little diorama for it, and that's what you see back there with the sort of semi-finished scenery on it, and the, the river, and the mill fall, uh, just barely visible to the right here, right up here. I didn't make it quite long enough for the scene. I obviously need to extend the river to the left and you can see the unfinished part there on the left-hand side. And then I need to extend it a little bit to the right. The trick when you extend rivers is they, they end. And if you end them at the foreground of the layout and the fascia, that's great. Uh, obviously I'm not doing that here but that's probably the easiest way to end a river on a scene. But if it goes into the wall, it, it kind of becomes a little problematic. It's really hard to disguise that joint where the river hits the, hits the wall. So I'm gonna use two tricks here, or two old, old time tricks here. One of them, and I think you can see it there, is in that little pink hill in the corner in the distance, you can see that it looks like there's a line, a black line in the middle of the pink hill, and there's actually a mirror there. It's a, it's, it's a small piece of mirror that's propped up against the hillside and the river is going to run into that. That's this tan area right down here. And the river is going to run into that and then uh, hopefully just kind of disappear in amongst the trees uh, and the hills. So it'll just be continued, but you won't, number one, you can't see your reflection in the mirror. And that's very important when you're dealing with mirrors uh, in this application. You want to make sure that the viewer doesn't see the woods staring back at him with a version of himself or herself so you you want to put the mirror at an angle like i have it here and you really have to work to get any kind of a reflection to show up in the mirror itself other than what i want people to see so that's a really good spot for that mirror the back here where you see here you go well what you see the back of the mirror there's gonna be a dense, very dense stand of trees right here, so you won't be able to see it from this side. And then I'm going to paint the blue sky wall down there a darker color just behind the mirror, mostly to mask it. It's not an attempt at scenic painting or artistry or anything. It's just to get rid of any light areas uh, that are down there. Over here on the right-hand side, I think you can see it. I'll try to zoom in. Uh, the, the way I'm gonna hide where the river ends here is basically with a, uh, half of a covered bridge <laughs> and the river will disappear under the bridge. I'm thinking that I originally I planned to put another mirror under there. I, I don't know that I need one. I'll probably get uh, try to find a small enough mirror, narrow enough mirror to put under there and try it out. And again, the left side of the bridge where you see that it's a half a bridge will be blocked by trees and, and uh, the river bank. And so it won't be quite so obvious. Uh, the bridge itself is probably about half or th two thirds of end scale. Uh, it's just made up, it's a real simple uh, three walls of scribe siding, 1 16th scribe siding. And I just gave it a quick wash stain with uh, highly thinned out raw umber acrylic paint. I followed that up with some watercolor pencils and then just put another wash of uh, a slightly lighter brown on top of it. Uh, the roof itself is just a piece of styrene. Uh, I painted some streaking in there. I, I may go back and add actual shingles or roof panels or something more specific to the roof, but the idea is, again, this is a background building that's going to disappear from view. It's about uh, 
two and a half or three feet from the closest point of the aisle and so it's it's pretty far back and and so the this is a better idea of what perspective you're looking at it's only an inch or two tall uh, at the tallest point actually less than two inches and it's about five inches long and it'll be kind of neat because that's smaller than n scale the mill building that's going to go here is n scale and then of course the foreground elements will all be ho scale that's enough talk about planning. Uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn the camera off and get back to carving the, <laughs> the foam here. I don't want to make you listen to that. It's probably pretty grim, but I will show you a couple of tricks that I use when I do this. Very large rough cuts, like when you're cutting the pieces out, you know, measure them to fit an area and do a rough cut to get the piece out. I use this saw, which is just a, a hand saw, cross cut saw. You can also use a keyhole saw. This and the teeth on this one is a little heavy and sometimes makes cuts that are just a little too rough. Uh, when you get this foam installed and want to start really carving it gently to shape or, or start getting big chunks that you don't want to use the rasp for, um, I use a smaller, just an X-Acto blade like this one. So those are the three ways that I cut the foam. The other way to shape the foam is, is to file it to shape or rasp it to shape. Uh, for that, I use an assortment of, <laughs> of well, rasps. Um, this is probably my favorite one. This is, a, you just draw it along the foam like this and it cuts the crumbs down and, and you end up with a nicely shaped hill. Uh, if you have a very large area that you can get into and want to do a, a relatively level uh, or basically on a single plane, say you wanted to cut this hill to a, a slope at that angle, this would be the tool I would use for that. This is just a longer version and straighter version. It's more square than this one is. And then I have a small one, uh, which when you get into get tight areas, like you know where you get in down here by the track, uh, get an embankments and things like that, this is really useful for that. The only other tool I use to cut the foam with is on the floor here. And that is, excuse my mess all over the place. I'm doing about 10 different things at once in this, <laughs> this basement. This is a, a shop vac. And I think it's an absolutely critical tool for any kind of model railroad work and especially for styrofoam scenery. One quick thing before I go, uh, you might notice that there's these little wedgies, wedges of foam stuck in here between the plywood and the, and the foam, the scenery base. And what I do there is inevitably you can't cut this foam, or at least I can't cut this foam to fit perfectly. And there's no reason to do that. What I do is I cut it to fit as close as I can. And then if there is a gap between the, uh, between the styrofoam and the wood, you'll end up, always end up with lots of little triangles like this when you cut this stuff. And then I just take it and I just put hot glue on either side of it and, and essentially shove it into the hole. And that does two things. It fills the gap here, any small gaps. You won't have scenery material, especially when we start flocking this and getting to that point, you won't have unsightly gaps between the plywood and the scenery. And it also serves to lock the styrofoam well in place. It really secures it. Uh, just another quick tip. Again, I'll be back in a little bit and I'll show you what progress we've made. And we're back. As you can see, we got the foam all carved to shape. This is very much a reductive process, which means it makes a pretty big mess. Uh, but we have here, I think you can get a better idea now if I show it this way, although it looks like some areas of the Southern New England have been hit by a blizzard. Um, what we have here is the green foam that you see in these two, this area and over towards here on where the mirror from the uh, river is under my hand here. That represents a tree line that's going to run this way and a tree line that's going to run this way basically towards the corner and then one coming out from the corner towards the track where you see that blue sharpie over there. And so that will help to isolate this scene from the scene that's over here which is our uh, which is our uh, Williams Creek scene, which is something else I've also been working on in conjunction with this. So I'm basically blending this whole area together. To the left here is the area you've seen before in the videos. 
and then we're just continuing around uh, around the corner here and so the next step obviously is to use some sculpta mold to finish patching some of this area i've got some sculpta mold here uh, just to kind of patch the area where the plaster cloth connects to the foam to get a good joint and smoothed out and then i'm going to go ahead and paint all this brown and put ground texture on so the next time you see this it's going to look pretty much like this in the meantime take care thanks for watching